follow along, I'll be reading from Luke chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. And after he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with him. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Bruce already mentioned we have our meeting. The fall meeting starts uh, tonight at 7. It's at 7 each night. We won't have meals before the meeting. He mentioned that as well. I want to ask a question before we start. How many of you, and you can raise your hands on this one if you want to, how many of you love Ethan Leslie? I love Ethan Leslie too. He's our speaker Tuesday night. Are you going to love in word only, or are you going to be here Wednesday night, or Tuesday night and listen to Ethan speak? I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we'll have good speakers every night, but I am really looking forward to Ethan Tuesday night, and I hope you are as well. Uh, I think we have a really good lineup, and, and, and we're looking forward to that. Today, we're going to continue in our series of meeting God's people, and we're going to try to meet Matthew. Now, Matthew's kind of hard to meet because he's kind of shy sometimes. Uh, maybe it's because he was ostracized by most of his society in the day that he lived, and, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Matthew wasn't his family name. His family name was Levi. Uh, and so you get a pretty good idea real quick what tribe he probably descended from, and you get a pretty good idea of what his lineage was like. Uh, he was the son of Alphaeus and possibly the brother of James the Lesser because James the Less is also called the son of Alphaeus. However, you can't set that in stone because for the Jews, oftentimes, you might say, I'm the son of Alphaeus if you were a grandson or a nephew or something like that, as did Jesus when he was referred to as son of David doesn't necessarily mean it was the same Alphaeus or that Alphaeus was their father and that they were brothers. But at any rate, he and James are, are related to one another, uh, possibly brothers. It might fit in with the other sets of brothers that Jesus has in his apostles. Uh, they were at least well-known and kinsmen to one another. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of Matthew's story or Levi's story other than that he penned the book of Matthew. He was a publican or a tax collector. His job was to, uh, to, uh, to go out and get money from people. For the Jews, they basically called it legalized thievery. That's the way they looked at it a lot of times. In those days, the Romans would employ tax collectors to collect for them. Their job was to go into the towns and villages and to collect whatever money they could in taxes from the Jews to go to the Roman government and they got a percentage of what they collected. Now can you imagine if the tax collectors always got a percentage of what they collected? That means they were probably pretty honest people, right? The more they collect, the more they get. Well, no, probably not. As a general rule, they were considered to be pretty crooked. They weren't all crooks, but they collected taxes as they saw fit. And they could use whatever means they wanted to. They could throw you in prison. They could confiscate all your belongings and possessions and sell them to their brother for a portion of the price that it's worth. And then they and their brother would split the actual price afterwards, and they'd give the, the portion they sold it to to the Roman government. That's the way things worked in those days. It was pretty ugly sometimes. Generally, to become a tax collector meant that you were greedy. You know, it was because you, you got into it for money. Uh, uh, they were considered traitors, traitors to their family, traitors to their country. You know, even the people who were legitimately paying their taxes begrudged the money going to their Roman overseers. 
It's not that they all hated paying taxes. Like today, we like having roads, we like having schools, we like the idea that, that when our kids at school get on a bus to go to a trip all the way to Pea Ridge, Arkansas, that they're gonna have a safe bus to ride all the way back from Pea Ridge, Arkansas. I can remember times when my boy was playing ball when, when the coach said, said, Mr. Hewlett, would you go over to the school over there and, and borrow a bus because our buses broke down. And I would go over to whatever town we were in, their school, and they would let me take a bus over and I'd pick it up, take it over, and take the boys back home from the baseball game because our buses weren't there. Isn't it great to have those things? Isn't it great to have clean water? Isn't it great to have the freedom to worship as we want? Those are all a result of paying taxes. And nobody begrudges paying taxes for the things we think are important. But how would you like to pay taxes to a government that absolutely did nothing but step on you? And absolutely did nothing but use the money you gave them to oppress you further? They didn't like it in Boston either. They had a big tea party. Y'all might remember that. Probably most of us weren't there, but uh, there may be somebody. Uh, you know, usually these people were considered the lowest of the low because you know how you got to be a tax collector? You went to the Roman government and you bought the right. Now, if I'm going to go buy the right to collect taxes and I'm going to get a percentage of the money I collect, I'm doing that for business purposes. And if I'm going to do that for my son, I'm doing that for his business purposes because I expect him to make a profit out of it. And so that's what was going on a lot of times when we look at that. Uh, I think it's important to understand that. A lot of times these are the lowest of the low, morally rotten men. Not all of them. You can't always say everybody is crooked, but a lot of them were. And we don't know if Matthew had ever heard Jesus preach before Jesus called him the first time. Uh, I believe it's likely he had. Uh, Jesus' message was so contradictory to the, to the lifestyle of tax collectors at that time and to the, to the common sense of the day that it probably intrigued Matthew to hear it. Think about what we know of the tax collectors back in those days and then listen to these words of Jesus. In Matthew 6, Matthew records these words, by the way, so, so maybe they touched home with him in a way that, that was really strong. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust d destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters. For either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. You know, in fact... Matthew seems to have gotten a whole new lease on life after he encountered Jesus. I think the writers of the Chosen series did a really good job in portraying Matthew. They, they, they show him as a, as, a, as a mostly honest young man who's trying to do what's right, but who's not really sure about this Jesus thing. 
And so he slinks around quite a bit. And you notice that as you watch the show, he, he kind of stays in the background. He, he kind of stays back. And, 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 and I, I remember reading an a article on, the, in a, on a website, is Matthew autistic in the show? Because of the way that he was, the way he kind of holds back from everybody else. And, and, they, and people seem to catch on that. But maybe it's because nobody likes tax collectors. And maybe they were portraying a man who nobody would like to have around him very much. So, so yes, in fact, he did hold back and try not to put on a big scene because he didn't want to be noticed a lot of times. I think they did a really good job portraying that. Um, we're going to learn some lessons today about ourselves in the story of Matthew. And the first one is a warning against the love of money. Again, we don't know that Matthew was a crook just because many tax collectors were. We don't know that he was. But we do know that there's a, there's a very thin line between having what we need and being comfortable with what we have and loving what we have to the point that we won't give anything up. See, there's a very thin line there. I love my truck. You know what I love about my truck? Eddie gave me the words a long time ago. It starts when I turn the key. You know what else I love about my truck? I don't have a truck payment. Those are the things I love best about my truck. It goes where it's supposed to go, and I don't have to make a payment. I love that about my truck. But you know what? My whole life's not tied up in it. And if I lost it, I'd wake up again tomorrow, and I'd figure out how to get something else to drive, and I'd go on with my life. We cannot allow ourselves to be tied up in our possessions, whatever they may be. We cannot. Uh, you know, Jesus tells us that we can't serve two masters. Uh, we need to understand that Ecclesiastes, right, way back when the preacher said, said that we can't get tied up with loving money because we'll never be satisfied. You can't have, how much is enough? How much is enough? You go, if you go today and you go to one of these advisors, financial advisors about planning your future and, and, and you ask him and you say, say, hey, I want to live, blah, 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 blah. And he'll say, well, how much do you want to have then? And you say, well, I don't know. I, you know. I'd like to live at the same level. Well, how much is enough? And he'll tell you it's going to take more than you make now to be ready to have what you want to make then. Uh, so so it's, there's no answer to that. There's no real answer to it at all. But just look at his writings, Matthew's writings. In Matthew 6, 19 and following what we just read uh, about our relationship with money and about how we shouldn't be constantly carried up with the money and concerned about money. He tells the parable of the sower, and he, he records that when Jesus tells the parable. And he says, you know, money and things can choke out our faith. And that's the warning that we get there. He tells in... Uh, Matthew 19, he writes, Jesus said to his disciples, this is Matthew recording it, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of needle than for a rich person to go to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? Can you imagine Matthew, who probably was wealthy among the apostles, writing those words down? <laughs> Wait a minute. What, what do you mean, Lord, it's, it's going to be hard for me to get to heaven? I, I, I'm, I'm the, the, wait, wait, wait. Uh, that's what I see when I read that. That's what I see when I read that. Jesus told his disciples, though, if anyone wants to come after him, we have to deny ourselves. We have to sacrifice ourselves. And we have to take up our cross and follow him. I think sometimes we have to remember those things. You see, the trouble's not with being rich. We typically view having a little bit of money as a blessing. You know, I started to put a picture up there that I found when this couple was obviously arguing over their bills, and they had a big stack of bills. Isn't it nice to be able to make your payments when, the, when it's time to make your payments? Isn't that a blessing that we have? Money's not evil. We need money to pay our bills. We need money to buy groceries with. We need money to, money's a whole lot easier. Can you imagine if when it was time to buy groceries and you needed a can of green beans, you had to take a cow over to them and say, hey, listen, I'll trade you this cow 
but not for one can of green beans. I need all of this. And you start trying to barter your stuff. Of course, where did you get the cow in the first place? What did you trade to get the cow? Can you imagine if we had a, money's a convenient way to do those things. There's nothing wrong with money. It's a convenience. It's the love of money that we have to worry about. In fact, in Luke, we hit the story of the, the rich man and Lazarus. And we see what the love of money resulted in in that particular story as we read it. Paul writes to young Timothy and he tells him, he says, he said, you need to be content. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And he tells him, he says, you need to learn to be content. You need to learn to be happy. You need to learn to be satisfied with what you have. And then he goes on, he says, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Not money, but the love of money. You know, some people will do anything for money. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a danger because of the love of money. We can't allow ourselves to lose sight of our soul's value over money. In Matthew 16 and 26, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will you give in return for your soul? What would you give for your soul? What would you take for your soul? If Satan showed up today and says, hey, I'll give you a golden fiddle. Or if Satan shows up today and says, I'll give you a new Mercedes. Or if Satan shows up today and says, tell you what, I'll pay off all your bills if you'll just bow down and worship me. Well, we'd look at him like he was crazy. I want more than that. Is there any amount? I love Toby Mac's song, I don't want to gain the whole world and lose my soul. Not willing to give up my soul for everything in the world. I love that, and I love the attitude expressed behind it. Also from Matthew, we can learn because we see a man who used his talents for Jesus. I think that's an important thing to do. When we think of bookkeepers and accountants today, we think of somebody that's well organized, and especially when it comes down to record keeping, they're, they're taking notes and they're making sure everything's right. I know when, when I talk to the accountant, I've got to make sure I've got all my receipts and I've got everything ready to go because that's part of doing their job is to make sure you have the right paperwork and everything's, all your T's are crossed, all your I's are dotted. If you've ever been through an audit, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You want everything right, and so that's what accountants do. Uh, I always say they're a little geeky towards numbers, and that's okay. They're supposed to be. You want your accountant to be that way. That's what we think of them and their organization skills and stuff. Maybe that's why the directors of The Chosen chose to portray Matthew as they did. Here's another idea. Maybe that's why God chose Matthew to talk about all the prophecies that were fulfilled because he's going to be meticulous about making sure he's got all his T's crossed and his I's dotted. He's the one that's going to make sure he covers everything thoroughly. And so maybe that's why he was called to do that particular job. Uh, his gospel account is one of the most systematic books that you'll ever read. I mean, it's just like, boom, this happened, and then boom, this happened, and then boom, this happened. It's like, this is orderly and, and precise, and we're showing everything that happened, and we're showing the numbers of people that were there, and we're showing all of these different things that are going on. He seems to be in it, and then he offers all these proofs that Jesus is the Messiah. Not just one proof, an entire book of proofs that Jesus is the Messiah. Peter Stoner, boy, he looks modern in that picture. He was a, a mathematician, and he used probability studies. And so he looked at the prophecies concerning Jesus in the Old Testament, only the Old Testament. And he said, the odds of any one man, any one man fulfilling eight of these prophecies, eight specific prophecies, the odds of any one man fulfilling any of those prophecies, eight of them, would be one in 10 followed by 157 zeros. 10 to the 17th power, something like that. That's what he said. To fulfill just eight prophecies. <clears throat> to me, that's an unimaginable number. I can't even, I was, I was trying to figure out whether that's a, 
a quadrillion or a quintillion or a bazillion or I don't I don't know it's a lot the odds are 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 totally impossible uh, and but but Jesus didn't fulfill eight prophecies no in fact Jesus fulfilled 324 prophecies so multiply those odds times another 324 levels I guess to do that uh, he said an easy way to understand it would be if you took the state of Texas and you covered it with silver dollars, every square inch with silver dollars, the stack would be two feet high. Then if you took one of those silver dollars and you marked it and you put all of them in a big pile and you took a blind man in there or a blindfolded man, the odds of him picking that one silver dollar are the same odds of one man being able to fulfill those prophecies. That's for eight prophecies. Jesus fulfilled 324. Matthew himself, he had another way to say it. Here's what Matthew said. Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem and in Micah 5, it's fulfilled in Matthew 2. The Messiah is going to be preceded by a messenger, it's fulfilled in Matthew 3. The Messiah is going to enter Jerusalem on a donkey, it's fulfilled in Matthew 21. The Messiah is going to be betrayed by a friend, it's fulfilled in Matthew 10, also in 26. The Messiah is going to be sold for 30 pieces of silver, it's fulfilled in Matthew 26. The money for which the Messiah is sold is to be thrown to the potter. It's fulfilled in Matthew 27. The Messiah is going to be born of a virgin. It's fulfilled in Matthew 1. The Messiah is going to be silent before his accusers. Fulfilled in Matthew 27. The Messiah is going to be given vinegar to quench his thirst. Fulfilled in Matthew 27. The Messiah is going to be buried with a rich when he dies. In Matthew 27, Messiah is going to be raised from the dead, Matthew 28. Messiah is going to be executed by crucifixion, Matthew 27. <clears throat> Remember the 10 to the 17th power for eight prophecies? Matthew gave us 12 here. You can add another nine zeros to the end of the number just from the prophecies Matthew gave us. And that's not counting the rest of the New Testament. In fact, today, now that they're allowed to, many Jews, modern Jews, are coming to follow Christ because they're reading their Old Testament and realizing it's not possible that he's not the Christ based upon what they've read. That's how powerful that message is. You know, with man, those numbers are astronomically impossible. Unbelievable numbers. I can't, I can't imagine. I, I started to just make a slide and, and put a one with, with all those zeros after it. And it just didn't make sense to try to do it. But with God, all things are possible. Aren't you glad that there are some people that are mathematically inclined and can think like that? I'm not that guy. I would a lot rather work with my hands on something and try to figure out how it works. I, I'm that guy. I'm the guy that takes a vacuum cleaner apart just to see how it works. That's, that's me. I, that's me. Math, well, I'm glad there's somebody that likes that. And uh, computers, I call Charlie. I mean, you know, that's, uh, there's, there's, there's things that you know and there's things that you don't know very well, and there's things we're skilled at. You know why? Because we're designed to be one body with many parts. We're supposed to be. We're interdependent upon one another. I can't do my part if you don't do your part. You can't do your part if I don't do my part. If, if Gail Fickle doesn't send out a prayer request for somebody, you don't know to pray for them. You know, that's the way it works. That's the, that's the way we as a body function sometimes. And if you don't call and tell her you need a prayer request, shame on you. She can't ask for prayers for you because she can't read your mind. You know, that's the way it works as a body. Each of us is unique with a special skill set. Ephesians 2 and 10 refers to us as a workmanship. And 1 Corinthians 12, well, you know that. It's all about one body with all kinds of parts with different functions. And like Matthew, we need to use our gifts for God. Next thing we see about Matthew is a man who appreciated what the gospel did for him. You know, Christ called him, and he followed, and he was saved. He was part of that group that was called out. Someone once said that religion is for really good people. 
But salvation is for sinners. Thank God that Jesus receives sinners. Thank God for that. Ray Stevens had a big hit back when I was a, a young teenager. And, uh, and, and I loved it a whole lot. He says, everything is beautiful in its own way. Like a starry summer night on a snow-covered winter's day. And then he says, everybody's beautiful in their own way. Under God's heaven, the world's going to find a better way. And then he talked about there are none so blind as those who refuse to see. And he said, we shouldn't worry about the length of his hair, the color of his skin. And he talked about how we ought to judge people based on who they are on the inside instead of who they are on the outside. Or we ought to accept people based on who they are on the inside and who they are, not who they are on the outside. We live in a world that's divisive. Oh, it's divisive. We want to be, we want to say, well, I'm black, so this. I'm white, so this. You're, you're, you're southern, so that. You're northern, so that. You're a westerner, so that. You're, you're a whatever. And we want to divide each other on every possible thing you can divide on. And God says, I want you to all be one. We all came from one. I like what Judd said in class one time. We're all just different shades of brown. I mean, there's lighter browns and darker browns, but we're all just different shades of brown. I, me personally, I change shades of brown throughout the year. My wife says it's a golfer's tan. That's okay. Because she's seen parts of me that don't get tan, like my back. And she says, it's kind of ugly, dear. You need to tan it. Uh, anyhow, we ought to recognize if Jesus came to earth 2,000 years ago to die for everybody, we ought to recognize the value of everybody. That's what Matthew represents to us. Can you imagine if that nasty old tax collector showed up in here? Or if it was an IRS agent in a suit, we'd welcome him in. Be afraid not to. But if it was some nasty old tax collector that was making his money off a percentage of how much extra he charged us, would we welcome him in very much? But we're supposed to be the body of Christ. Here's a question my dad used to ask a lot. If Jesus came today, on this day, back to earth, would he be at Harding at chapel? No, they don't have chapel on Sunday, so that's a trick question. Would he be at the largest congregation in the country? Would he be here at this building? Or would he maybe be at a homeless shelter somewhere helping those that are hurting? I think he'd come to church first. Because when I read about him, it says he went to synagogue, as was his custom. So I think he'd come to church first. But then I think he'd be out helping people. Casting Crown says... If we're the body, why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his words teaching? If we're the body, why aren't his feet going? And why aren't, his, if, why aren't we showing them that there's a better way? If we're really the body of Christ, why aren't we doing the work we need to do? Because Matthew understood what God had done for him. Out of all the apostles, when describing himself, Matthew refers to himself as Matthew the tax collector. In Old King James, it says Matthew the publican. That's what it says there. He refers to himself as a tax collector or a publican. Nobody else reminds us of that. Everybody else has accepted him into the family. But Matthew knows where he came from. He hasn't forgotten who he was before. And folks, we must never forget who we were before. If we remember George the sinner... It's a whole lot easier for George the sinner to want to help save somebody than for George the okay guy who thinks everybody else is okay. Not that we dwell on our past, but that we never forget from whence we come. And that we always want to help other people find their way to Jesus. That's the point of Matthew and what he appreciated. We also see a man that didn't let his critics discourage him. You know, notice what he did as a new follower of Christ. 
When Jesus called Matthew, Matthew immediately hosts a feast. Oh, there's a clue about his wealth. He hosts a feast. Luke even says it was a great feast that he threw. So it was a big deal. He throws a big feast for, for Jesus and, and he invites all these people. And, and, and you know what the religious leaders did? The religious leaders immediately said, oh, wait a minute. Speaking of Jesus, this guy hangs out with tax collectors and sinners. Look what kind of man he is. They immediately started criticizing him. You know, there's an old joke about a fellow that shows up in church, and when the preacher was preaching, after a couple of minutes, the fellow hollers out, Amen! And a couple of minutes later, the fellow hollers, Preach on, brother! And a couple of minutes later, he said, You said it, brother! And a little bit later, he says, I got religion! And one of the deacons said, You didn't get it here. You know, folks, Matthew was excited about meeting Jesus. Matthew was excited about having his life transformed. Matthew wanted to share that with the whole world, and everybody around him just wanted to throw a wet blanket on him. That's what happened in his story when we start reading that story. How many times do we find ourselves when somebody's really excited, a new Christian, we must be careful to not throw a wet blanket on their flame. We must be careful not to do that. You know, uh, sometimes we can feel discouraged by the way other people look at us. But Jesus said not to judge by appearances. Judge with right judgment. Matthew teaches us in the Sermon on the Mount. He writes Jesus' words there. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. If you're on fire for Jesus, don't worry about what the rest of the world thinks. If you want to share your faith with somebody, don't worry about what the rest of the world thinks. Because Jesus says, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you for my name's sake. Not because you were vile and evil, but because of his name's sake. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward few practical lessons from Matthew this morning as we close. Don't let your wealth determine your worth. Use your talents to accomplish God's will. Remember where you were before you were forgiven. And don't let anybody criticize you or discourage you as you go about doing God's work. This morning, perhaps you're not a child of God. Maybe it's time for you to be baptized into Christ. The Bible's very clear those who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Those who are baptized into Christ are in Christ. They're a new creation. They are saved. Their sins have been forgiven. Peter says you repent and you're baptized for the remission of your sins. Your sins are washed away in that act of baptism. And maybe you've never done that. If you're not in Christ this morning, you're outside of Christ. Let me beg you to get in Christ. Maybe you're a Christian who needs help in your walk. Maybe you have struggles in your life and you need prayers. If there's any way we can help you at all, won't you come while we stand and sing to encourage you?